He's giving up his summer for a great cause. I'm not sure why, but we'll talk about it. Welcome in. Great to have you on board. Laura just gave me a funny wave. Did I talk too long at the beginning there? And when Laura goes like this, I'm like, whoa, what did I do? What did I do? Yeah, we have, uh, we have a very loose arrangement here as to how we start this show. Good Tuesday evening to you. First real hot, humid summer day. Yes, July 1st. And as I think I said last night, slow the calendar down. I want to soak up this summer. And hopefully Arthur doesn't screw up our 4th of July coming up the coast. Outer banks in North Carolina seem like they'll be first to hit, but that would be Tony's territory. Check that out on WPRI and WPRI.com and Fox Providence and all of that. Anyway, Mark Zakari is my guest tonight. Mark is a, is a stalwart Republican in Rhode Island, has run for Congress twice against Jim Langevin, got thumped both times, but, you know, he's, he's one of these talents and thinkers that I think if he was in another place in another time, he would be a very viable candidate. He is jumping into the race to run against, uh, or into the election season, to run against Jack Reed, our senior U.S. senator. And if you're rolling your eyes saying, why would anybody that we really don't know that well do that? I understand. Mark will explain. And there's a real story behind it. And frankly, a little bit of a shame internally, I think, in the leadership of the Republican Party. Because while they complain about the circumstances, they didn't do anything to make it better. That's a little bit of a tease. In the meantime, let us go to the other teases that we do. When we do the rundown here, yep, that's the president doing the old Fleetwood Mac type of thing because he's going his own way. Big medical news today. We talked about it on the radio. I'll tell you what the feedback was with women who now don't have to hustle in for those tests that you don't necessarily like to go through. The, uh, the, you know, I was telling uh, the crew here tonight that I, I put this story in after reading it uh, this morning. It got a lot of real estate in the Providence Journal, and I'm still not sure why. But sometimes you just kind of throw stuff in like that. In case you missed the joke last night, I never really tied it together for you, and so I shall. And look, I'd, 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 I'd be much more of a World Cup guy if they would just do that. All right, let's dig in. Let's go, because... I want to spend some quality time with Mark Zakaria this evening. Our first item, as you just saw, is go my own way. The president, headline, he's going to take executive action on this long, grinding debate on immigration. As you know, the Senate passed a bill. The House hasn't taken it up. The House has their own bill, which is much more narrow. The Senate doesn't want to take it up. John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, let the president know earlier this week ain't going to happen. Here's what CBS has on that. It's just politics, plain and simple. The president said that because Speaker John Boehner informed him last week that the House would not vote on immigration this year, he will take action on his own. I don't prefer taking administrative action. I'd rather see permanent fixes to the issue we face. Certainly that's true on immigration, and that's why today I'm beginning a new effort to fix as much of our immigration system as I can on my own. Yeah, he really hasn't been very definitive on what those things will be. Look, I think the president shares our frustration. We share it with him, maybe for the wrong reasons, and perhaps he is part of the reason why we are all frustrated. Does that make any sense to you? But we got to get an up and down vote across chambers. It doesn't matter if it goes down. If it goes down, the reasons as to why it would go down would be more illustrative and we'd have better debate. But by not having up and down votes in both chambers on immigration, we're in this kind of stalling pattern. Now look, if it's absolutely incumbent that we load up a bunch of greyhounds and school buses and a whole bunch of other things to take 11 million people out of this country, forget about it. It's not going to happen. Now will programs like E-Verify and cutting medical benefits to illegal aliens, undocumented immigrants, make your choice, have an impact on that 11 million population? Absolutely. Let's toss that stuff in. But the mandate, that, you know, I hear this on the radio all the time from people on my show weekdays noon to 3 on WPRO. Just got to send them back, then we'll talk about it. Not going to happen. How we get the border security and what guarantees we put into place? Good faith, it seems. And maybe that's why the whole thing breaks down, because there is none. Next item. Yeah, I thought this was fascinating. So I was 
at the early uh, round, I, you know, we, at the golf course I play at, we uh, have early rounds at 6.30 in the morning on Tuesdays. Do I look like I'm dragging a little? Uh, and one of the guys who's hanging around the club, who's a retired doctor, pulls me aside and says, you've got to talk about this. This is outrageous. This gives women another excuse not to get their exams. Here was the headline. Guideline calls routine pelvic exams unnecessary. Now, if I understand correctly, this is the internist group that made this recommendation. The gynecological types are still saying we'd like to have you in every year. That might have to do with revenue. I'm not exactly sure, but it seems like we got a deal here where uh, pelvic exams, which I hear are not comfortable, and the pap smears, which detect cervical cancer, may be only necessary every three years now. Now the American College of Physicians is recommending against pelvic exams for most women. The guideline says a pelvic exam, quote, rarely detects important disease and does not reduce mortality and is associated with discomfort for many women, false positive and negative examinations, and extra cost. Now look, you know, I'm not a doctor and for this conversation I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, but on the radio today as I was discussing it, women were fairly Eh, not moved by the conversation, so okay, maybe this is an okay idea, but it did morph into a colonoscopy conversation. You know, the notion that people are afraid of certain procedures. And I implore you, if you are near 50 or 50 or older and you have not had your colonoscopy, another procedure that people have anxiety about, do it. Have I ever told you my story on the TV? I had a colonoscopy in the middle of a sentence. I said to the nurse, how long is this gonna take? And the next thing I said is, are we ready? And she said, you're done. It's that easy. The day before, not so much. But, you know, what are you going to do? All right. Are you guys laughing over there? Were you laughing? Laura was laughing? You want to tell your colonoscopy story? No, no, no it's all right. Uh, but <laughs> why not? It's better than your gynecological exams, which are they're a whole nother. I don't want to go. Okay. I got up too early this morning. Let's move on. Next item. He might have been a Republican. Oh, wow, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Here was the headline today, Caprio Mould running for treasurer as a Republican. Look at the real estate for that story. I looked at the story, I said, wow, there's a lot of writing in there. And what it comes down to is this old Frank Caprio, who was the state treasurer, first the state senator, then ran for state treasurer successfully, and then ran for governor unsuccessfully in 2010. I guess Mould moving to the Republican Party as governor candidate in 2010, but never pulled that trigger, and then dated the Republican Party again, this time around, talking about running for treasurer as a Republican, but yet again, he remains as a Democrat. That's the whole story. A lot of real estate for it. The thought I had was, though, Republicans who blame Caprio who, for perhaps, you know, holding on too long as a potential candidate in their party for treasurer, need to stop complaining. Your party's in shambles, and you cannot blame Frank Caprio for leaving you at the altar. Next item. So last night, I don't know that I actually pulled the joke all together. You know, Brett Smiley, the candidate for mayor, a Democratic candidate for mayor, has been antagonizing Buddy Cianci, the new independent candidate for mayor. That's a funny way of saying it, right? Because he ain't new, that's for sure. Uh, but here was a press release he issued today Smiley calls on Cianci to take two government pledges, two good government pledges. Uh, he doesn't want uh, Cianci to take any money from the employees, you know, to put the, uh, uh, to put the thumb on them, and then some pension stuff there. So I, I noted today that Smiley's really kind of had a full court press pressing Cianci, uh, and Smiley's not even out of a Democratic primary just yet. Um, interesting. In fact, Smiley said to Cianci, I want to debate on character. We talked about it last night. I'm happy to debate him anywhere. That, that's exactly the problem, because it's not just that I think the, the reputation of Providence could be damaged, but that he's shown no contrition for it. He's tried to downplay, tried to minimize, said this was some guy down the hall that took a C note. It's far more serious than that. And if there's no act of contrition, if there's no actual regret, how can we feel any confidence that things are going to be different this time? So will you take the bait and end up at the foxy lady with him if, if that's the only place he'll do this? Well, you know, if we end up there, you can know who's going to get distracted and who's not. I thought that, I thought that was a good line. Remember, 
Uh, it was Cianci that said, I'll debate the kid, you know, after the primary. Maybe we ought to go to the foxy lady where his father-in-law had a piece of the action. Turns out his father-in-law is deceased, did have a piece of the action. Smiley was offended by it. But the idea that he won't be distracted there is because he's gay. And I don't know if we close that loop. He's gay. I don't think Buddy is. So, Buddy, be careful what you ask for. You want to stay focused. And finally... <laughs> Just wanted to make sure we closed that loop, didn't leave anybody wondering. This is all they got to do to get me. I walk in the building today, and a prominent Channel 12 personality says, you're going to watch the game after the taping of your show, which we tape around 4 o'clock every day. That's when USA and Belgium first dropped the soccer ball. I can't, so anyway, this guy says, you're going to watch the game? I said, uh, you know, that soccer thing. He goes, oh, me too. So everyone's like in this politically correct mode. Hey, you gonna watch the soccer game? And as soon as somebody says, oh, I'm gonna, they go, yeah, me too. Although I know there's a lot of you that enjoy it at the bars. Stop the clock. I'm confused by the overtime and the running time and the extra time. And keep it simple for me. Let me understand it. Stop the clock. Simple as that. I hope we won. Mark Zakaria next. He's got quite the story. I did not think I would see this name as a candidate for U.S. Senate. Here is the headline last week, a couple days ago. Former GOP Chairman Zakaria takes on Reid. And there's a story behind it. Mark, nice to have you. Dan, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. And it is always a pleasure. I always enjoy your visits. They've been uh, for years on radio, now on TV. Um, Thought-provoking and the like. I don't know if you heard what I said at the, during the rundown. But I did. Put you in a different place, in a different time, in a different spot in the country, whatever. I think you'd be the kind of guy that would be incredibly viable for a um, Republican competitive federal seat. But you are mired in this blue state um, with not a lot of personal wealth to write a check, I guess, to... Not anymore. Finance, <laughs> <laughs> to, finan to, to, to finance your campaigns. And uh, you're running against U.S. Senator Jack Reed. Mm -hmm. And some people would ask, why would you ruin your summer? Well, um, why would we as a party ruin everybody's summer by not making an alternative available to a guy who we believe has done more harm than good in the seat? Now, we had a candidate that was all teed up to run, financing included, or so he says. Uh, that <coughs> fell through because of a very well-known uh, bunch of drama in the city of Warwick. Well, let's talk about how the story is done. So, uh, Laura, throw up the picture of Ray McKay, if you can, or if you haven't done that already. Uh, this is Ray McKay. He's a city employee in Warwick, and he's uh, got exempt status for some reason. And, uh, you know, this, it's a classification thing. has got nothing to do with anything other than 40 years ago, the status of his employee prevented him from running for, you know, an elected yeah, office. Right. And some, some caper that must have been going on in the early 1970s. Probably something that nobody can remember now. Right. But the deal is that, um, in essence, the uh, city council in Warwick, if I may, uh, caved to pressure, probably from the, uh, from the Reed uh, committee, and said, uh, no, we're not going to change this. I, mean, I don't know that there's a reason in the world because, you know, for instance... Well, let's every be clear with everybody. The, the, this, so this ordinance exists. It, pre it prevents um, raised classification from running. Right. Of course, firefighters, police people, teachers, they can all run. But he's oh, a, And all the elected officials. And all the elected officials, they can all run. Da -da 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 -da. So these so-called classified employees are a small fraction of the total workforce right. it's a total in total sham. Okay. Right, I agree. It was a Could total have been sham. changed by a vote any night from last October when it first came up. Right, and the council didn't. But now I point to the Republican mayor of the city who did not use his bully pulpit to shake up that council and demand that they do what is right. I he hid behind the idea that I don't want to look like I'm muscling anybody in politics. That is the biggest passive-aggressive pile of manure I have heard in recent time. Look, I don't, I don't agree with that assessment. I think that uh, Scott Avedesian has learned over the years how to run uh, a political enterprise as a minority member. I mean, he's, he's, he's totally outvoted potentially on the, uh, on the city council, and he has to take that into consideration. I believe that he offered certain options uh, to the city council and perhaps even to Ray that might have... Uh, like? 
I didn't hear like any. Leave of absence, Ray couldn't do that because of pay. Like, um, it's, 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 it's a negotiation well, that shouldn't have happened. They well, should have changed the damn ordinance, take the classification out of there, and he should have led absolutely, on that. Absolutely, but it wasn't. And the Republican Party should have put the pressure on him to lead on that. The Republican Party can't tell anybody who is a Republican in office what to do. The Republican Party gets Republicans elected. Once they're elected, it is to the will of the people that they that they serve. You know, it's so it's so convenient. Well, now, I don't want to be antagonistic I'm, with you on this because you're because you're the guy who's yeah, picking up the pieces, and I think you're uh, you're the Christian soldier who's doing the right work here. But doggone it, this guy was hung out to dry by a stupid ordinance, and he had nobody helping him except a lawyer and the bills to pay uh, on the fight. Jack Reed could have stepped in as a sportsman and said, "By the way, you know, stop it." He could have had a higher altitude on this and he decided not to get involved. What I've heard is that he did just the opposite. That he worked it hard yeah. to prevent the guy from being exactly. eligible. Why? Because he was a major player too? I don't know. I mean, I'm expecting something tomorrow because he's gonna, if he was afraid of uh, Ray McKay, maybe he's going to be afraid of me too. I always like it when my opponent is afraid of me. Why? What is he going to come in for you? What, 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 what problem do you no present idea. other than you're smart on the issues? <laughs> well, that's all I want to make this, this campaign about. And one of the reasons that when we had to hustle and find somebody, when Ray finally had to drop out really at the 11th hour, uh, we had to find somebody that had a certain amount of name recognition. There were others with more, but they were unavailable. Uh, we had to find somebody who was enough of an adult and, and you know could talk to the media and could talk to the people and say, here's what the Republican option is. There are, there are things about smaller government. It puts more money in your pocket. You should consider doing that. All of And you draw the short straw because there was nobody left. Well. See, see I, don't want, I don't want to characterize this as short straw. You know, when we come yeah, back, no, we'll talk about the issue because he's too good to call it short yeah, straw. Yeah, it's not short straw. But I stepped up because I was who was available to go and be a real counterbalance to Jack Reed. I hope to be a candidate right, We'll talk about why gravity. you are. Stay with us. Don't go. Be right back. Mark Zakari is my guest. He's the Republican candidate for U.S. Senate. And I don't want you to misunderstand. I, I think he's got all the right stuff to make the arguments for his philosophy and ideology and the skill set. It's just that it always comes down to in American politics today, the resources uh, versus an incumbent. If you look at the data on incumbents getting turned out, even though there's a lot of turbulence in the country, it didn't happen much. Uh, it, it, any, any challenger is way behind the, the uh, power curve in terms of money. A, a challenger must have much more than the incumbent in, in a war chest. Two weeks ago, I didn't know I was doing this, mm. and so um, uh, you know I am at a, at a severe disadvantage. But it is so important. I believe that Jack Reed costs the average Rhode Islander thousands of dollars of a year just by being there. I would look at things like the uh, the sudden increase that we're seeing in deductibles for health care. I would look at the two dollar increase in uh, gasoline over the last couple of years. If you only use ten gallons a, a, a week, and I wish that was me, uh, that's a grand per year right there. And that's because of the slow motion inflation that's coming from the monetary policies that, uh, and, and, and the, the uh, keeping the economy down that he and his perch in the banking committee is right in there with. I mean, it's not just him, but uh, boy, he's a cog in that wheel. And, uh, and all of that stuff costs us money, but boy, we, you know, we have inertia now. Oh, well, you know, Jack has been there a long time. He's a nice guy, and he is a nice guy. And he's a senior statesman, uh, right? So, you know, he's international, and he's Fox News, CBS, Good Morning America. Is he? I don't see him in any of those places, but any well, event, no, yeah, I mean, you know. Well, Jack Reed does more national interviews than he does local. Because <laughs> okay. I have some questions about uh, Jack's um, um, uh, resources to his political campaign from the banking industry, which is, and, and it's the reason why Jack, although he's very friendly with me when I see him out on the road, he does not want to, he does not want to sit for this conversation so I can say, not. how dare you take money from the banking industry, an industry that you regulate while sitting on a committee. Uh, but you know what, we get to the, it's not even a professional politician, it becomes a corporate politician. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so anyway, are you going to, are you going to beg and put pressure on the media outlets at least for some free radio and television debates? Well, I mean, look, you know, I, I, uh, what's the status I of your I have to tell it like it way? is, and I hope I get as much earned media as possible, because I know how much, you know, 
purchase media I'm going to be able to get until I until I really can start hitting it big with fundraising. Well, if you just jumped in, you'd be want you'd be considered by corporate media kind of to be a gadfly. But you've already paid the price, I think. You've won against uh, Jim Langevin in Congress twice. You've shown mm -hmm. you've been a a, a, um, a leader in the state Republican Party. You have you have you have put your 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 miles in. And I think you've got the equity to be treated like a valuable, real candidate. And I hope that the, the media management in this town uh, treats you that way. You can come here as many times as you want between now and the general election. All we got to do is say, Jack, you can come too. Uh, final thought, because uh, we'll do some issue stuff next, in the next visit, but what is the number one issue you think would drive this U.S. Senate, US Senate race? Money. It's the, it's the money in the pocket of the hardworking, taxpaying men and women of Rhode Island. It is being picked daily by a government that's just getting bigger and bigger and is incapable of spending it efficiently. Pretty easily said. Good luck in the race. Thank you. Sacrificing your summer. What is, did you, it, is it summer? What did you say to me at the, when, when, we, when we saw, I saw I you on the hallway? Somebody told me it was summer, but is that true? Nobody, nobody, nobody what for people who uh, self-inflicted Oh, wound? yeah, well, there is no sympathy for self-inflicted wound. I did volunteer for this. All right, when we come back, your state of mind, stay with us. You know, that'll be very interesting as to whether there's, you know, Major League televised debate scheduled for U.S. Senator Jack Reed to defend his incumbency. I would hope it, I would hope there is. I'll have to get back to you on that. It's above my decision grade level, certainly, but um, I'd like to know, and I'll find out. Your state of mind is important. Uh, that's how you call us. Here is a voicemail from last night. I was just watching... The latest episode with that guy smiling. Out of any of the candidates so far, he is the most interesting one that's been out there. You know, the whole thing with Fancy is I wish he would stay, you know, out of politics, give the mantle to somebody else. Let's see what happens because I'm really concerned that if Fancy gets in, things are going to get a lot, are going to go downhill again. It's all about Smiley and Fancy, and I got to go. We'll see you tomorrow. Ernie El Monte, tomorrow night. Bye.